Okay, the topic today is ancient Rome. We're going to take a look at the origins of Rome and some of the things that they were doing in the BC era. Now, one of the things that's important to understand is the geography centered on modern day Italy, of course. Um, Rome was located on the Tiber River and it was surrounded by seven rolling hills. The historian Livy wrote about Rome's location as a very effective one, surrounded by hills, so natural barriers of defense, access to the sea, not too distant, uh, you know, away from it. And so you've got some, uh, some nice advantages of being on the Tiber River, nice surroundings, access to trade, things of that nature. The first Romans, though, if you really think about it, came in prehistoric times um, from about 1000 to 500 BC. Three distinct groups really kind of vied or battled for control of the area. That was the Latins, the Greeks, and also the Etruscans. In fact, if you look at history, the Latins are believed to be the first Romans because we have some huts that are have been discovered along the seven rolling hills there buried under the soil. Archaeologists have deemed that those were built in the style of the Latins. And so we believe they were the, really the first Romans. Between 750 and 600 BC, the, though the Greeks uh, established colonies along southern Italy, especially in Sicily, one of Sparta's major allies, Syracuse, was uh, centered in southern Italy and all along the island of Sicily. Now, the Etruscans were native to northern Italy, and they were actually very influential to the later Romans. In fact, the architectural style of the arch and the Roman alphabet system, Roman numerals especially, come from the Etruscans. Roman numeral number two is going to talk about the governing style that comes out of ancient Rome, and that is going to be the Republic. It starts with the Etruscan kings in power around 600 BC, and Etruscan was the king of Rome. Rome grew from a collection of small villages to a city of over 500 square miles. One king in particular is noteworthy. His name was Tarquin the Proud. In 509 BC, the Romans declared they would never be ruled again by a king after his, his time period. One of the reasons he's called Tarquin the Proud is that he was just very much into himself, kind of uh, bullied the people, forced them to pay heavy taxation, things of that nature. Republica, race publica, stands for public affairs or public things, and that's where the word republic came from. So they no, wanted, no longer wanted monarchy, and they branched into a republic. A republic is a form of government in which power rests with citizens who have the right to vote for their leaders. Basically, in our country, the United States of America, we don't vote on every last issue, but we do elect individuals to represent us. And the form of power that we have is that if we don't like the way that they're representing us, then when the next election comes, we, we need to vote otherwise. Um, that's sort of the power that you hold as a, as a citizen and voter in this country. Patricians and plebeians are sort of the social class system of Rome. The patricians are the wealthy landowners. They had very small numbers, but they held most of the power. The plebeians were the commoners, the common farmers, artisans, merchants. They made up the vast majority of the population. The patricians and plebeians were constantly struggling for power politically, physically sometimes, um, but, uh, but most of all through political organization. You also had a group called the tribunes. Now, the tribunes were actually elected officials by the plebeians to protect their voting rights because, see, the patricians, they didn't want the plebeians making any decisions. And so they were constantly trying to restrict and take away the voting rights of the plebeians. Eventually, we had the 12 tables, which came to be Rome's first official laws in 451. They're basically carved on 12 tablets and displayed in the forum, which was the Roman government hub or center, to establish the idea that all free citizens had the right to be protected under the law. This was necessary because of the patricians trying to use their wealth and influence to take away powers from the plebeians. Now, there is a section in the text here that I'd like to pause and, and take a look at. Here, first of all, is the geographic map. This is sort of, this is Rome right here. And then all of this sh light shaded purple would become the Roman Empire up to about 117 AD. So you can see that they spread pretty far throughout the entire Mediterranean world here. But there's also an important chart. This would be an example of the forum right there where the Senate would meet and discuss and debate. There's also 
There's some ancient ruins of Rome, which was the Forum, actually. And then this is a very important chart here for uh, students in my class. This is page 157. It basically compares the republic that was Rome against the republic that is the United States of America. So that chart's a really important one to study as we go forward. Okay, let's talk about how government was designed under the Republic. Well, Rome basically achieved what would be considered a balanced form of government by combining the best characteristics of the following three forms. Had a little bit of monarchy, had some aristocracy, when you think about the Senate and uh, popular ruling families, had a little bit of democracy with voting for representatives and things of that nature. A balanced and blended form of government, you could say. At the top of the Republic were consuls. The consuls were two officials that served like kings. They were in charge of the army and they did direct the government. They had limited power though. They only were able to serve a one year term and they could not be reelected for another 10 years. One council could always overrule or veto the other's decision. So they kind of balanced each other off. The Senate was responsible for legislative and administrative functions of the Republic. Legislative is lawmaking and law passing. They were made up of 300 members that were chosen from the patrician class, the upper class of Roman society. Eventually, later on, plebeians would, would be in, involved and allowed into the Senate. They did have a special circumstance called the dictator. A dictator was not an absolute uh, uh, standpoint in the government, but a dictator was a leader who could be put in place with absolute power to make laws and command the army. This would only be done in times of crisis, and a dictator's power would only last for six months. Dictators were generally chosen by the Senate, and they were appointed into that position. Next is point number five, the Roman army. All citizens who owned land were required to serve in the Roman military. It was organized into large military units called legions, which were made up of 5,000 heavily armed foot soldiers and cavalry. Legions were then divided into smaller units called centuries, which you would think would have 100 men, but in fact, they only had 80 men. Rome's army was a key determining factor to its rise to greatness. Roman numeral three, we'll talk about how Rome being along the Mediterranean Sea eventually goes out and spreads its power. First of all, they're gonna take control of all of Italy in 265 BC, and then they would conquer peoples in many different areas and regions, and they would bring them into the Roman Empire in different ways based on their proximity from Rome, the actual city of Rome. Areas that were close were granted full citizenship and voting rights. Further areas were granted citizenship but could not vote, and then all other conquered peoples became what were called allies of Rome, which meant that they had to provide troops to the Roman military. Capital B talks about Rome's commercial network. The Romans traded wine and olive oil for a variety of other foods, raw materials, and manufactured goods. Other powerful cities began to try and interfere with Roman power um, in the Mediterranean. And one of the biggest competitors that came on the rise was the North African city-state of Carthage. Rome actually went to war with Carthage in a series of wars called the Punic Wars. These wars lasted from 264 all the way down to 146 BC. So over 100 years of back and forth between Rome and Carthage. The first Punic War was for control over Sicily, which would then grant control over the access to the Western Mediterranean region. It was 23 years. It went from 264 to two, uh, down to 241 BC, and Carthage ended up losing. The Second Punic War began in 218 BC with the leadership of Carthage being led by Hannibal, who was a 29-year-old Carthaginian general. He wanted to avenge the loss in the First Punic War, which was led by his family members. Number two, we talk about Hannibal's tactics. He was a great tactician. He actually used war elephants and crossed over the Alps to invade Italy. He won a vast series of battles against the Italians, but he was never able to totally conquer the city of Rome. And it was during his time that he was in Italy, which was quite a few years, that the Romans came up with a plan to attack Carthage. The leader of this was Scipio, the famous Roman general 
Scipio Africanus. He was appointed general of Rome, and to counter Hannibal's attack, he put together an attack on the city of Carthage. This attack forced Hannibal to leave Rome and Italy and return to Carthage in, in an attempt to defend his home city. In the year 202 BC, the Battle of Zama was fought, and the Romans finally defeated Hannibal. Later, there was a third Punic War, which went from 149 to 146 BC, and Rome then laid siege to Carthage, setting it on fire, and its 50,000 inhabitants were actually sold into slavery. This gave Rome dominance over what is known as the Mediterranean region, and they then went and focused on the eastern half of the Mediterranean. Now, this is a five-section chapter, so it's a pretty long one, and I just wanted to show you a little bit about the Punic War. So here's Carthage up here in northern Africa. Here's Sicily. Here's Rome. This is the path that Hannibal chose. He went up through Spain. He crossed the what's called the Strait of Gibraltar in ships and then went up through the corner of Spain, through the Pyrenees and through the Alps, where in the Alps he lost a lot of his elephants and a lot of men because it's a very, very difficult terrain to traverse. And then here's the movement from Scipio, from Sicily here, to attack Carthage. The blue line is Scipio's invasion route. The Battle of Zama took place 202 BC right here. One major loss that, that uh, Hannibal handed the, the Romans was at Cannae in 216. It was a very, very big win for the Carthaginians.